This week on FX Guide TV. We talked to character designer and concept artist Neville Page. He's well known for his work with James Cameron in Avatar, JJ Abrams in Cloverfield and both Trek films, and Ridley Scott in Prometheus. We sit down one on one with him in his LA studio to discuss his work and his process. Plus, we also look at the new term over at fxphd.com. This and more coming up next. Hello and welcome to FX Guide TV. Well, it has been a crazy busy second half of the year and we've had a bunch of great news, especially coming out of Europe. But this week, the guys have an unexpected treat. But before we cross, I just want to remind you of the brilliant work being done over at fxphd.com. So if you like FX Guide TV, at FXPHD you get not only great training, but an additional weekly FX Guide TV style video called Background Fundamentals, which covers key tech behind the industry. Right now, on with the show. So thanks so much for joining us. It's a great honor to have you here. Thank you. So I was wondering, uh, obviously you've done a huge body of work. Sometimes though, you've had to do work that is clearly in, I guess, the shadow of some of the greats. I'm thinking now of Prometheus in particular. Um, can you talk to me about that history of the work uh, and how you sort of feel that you fit into it? Well, for one, it's a comfortable shadow to be in. That's for sure, because uh, the, these are the people that have been my inspiration to actually be in the film industry to begin with. So, um, and it's also a unique, my situation as a designer, as a concept designer in film, because usually you work in an art department and you work under the production designer, which is also a tremendous amount of fun. Um, and you work with a huge art department of other people, like minds, different talents. So you get to be in this world where you're educated by others with their skill sets. For me, I... I uh, I've somehow become a specialist as a creature designer and I tend to work directly with the directors. The upside is clear. The downside is I'm typically not in the art department in that traditional sense. But I do believe that the, the upside outweighs the downside because I get to be by their side and I'm, I'm learning other things that I would not normally learn because when I'm by their side, I'm literally on set, typically with my laptop um, and waiting. Uh, it, it kind of feels like I'm an actor at that point because you spend most of your time waiting for the director to come by and give you some notes. But it's worth it because you learn a tremendous amount about the whole process. And you also tend to be a little bit more collaborative because you are with the director, you're near the writers, you're near the producers, and you, you see a lot more so you can contribute a lot more. But you know, to your point about what, what does it mean to be in the process of this, particularly with Prometheus, there were two guys, Ridley Scott and, of course, George Lucas with Star Wars, that were the impetus for me to want to be in film. And to sit with Ridley and have him kind of historically reference Alien as we're working on the new Alien, even though it wasn't really announced as an Alien film, uh, was disorienting. One, because I wanted to just get his autograph and I'd have been happy to not work on a film just because I'm such a huge fan. But getting to, I had to put my fanboy on the back burner and just kind of focus on the work. But every now and then it would just percolate up. And I'd think, oh my God, I'm sitting with Ridley Scott talking about these movies that I only dreamed of, of owning versus working with the man on the next film itself. I guess with the engineers uh, in the map room, his suit in particular, that was very much um, a design that needed to sit inside and a design aesthetic that had been established in the earlier films. But with the engineers themselves, I feel like you had a really interesting, different challenge. Do you want to talk about that? The engineers were a big challenge because there was artwork that preceded my involvement by Carlos Suante, who I consider one of the greatest creature designers out there. And he's been a huge inspiration to me as well with um, basically my aesthetic and introducing me to things about creature design that I wasn't even aware of. It, and what we were trying to discover together, myself and Ridley with the engineers, is that perfect balance for Ridley of godlike, perfect human form, human features um, that felt alien and not in the alien franchise way, just felt alien to us. And the reason it was very, very difficult is because 
we weren't really designing something that was crazy um, unique aesthetically. It was just a guy, a perfect male specimen. And that's such a subjective thing. So uh, it was really about going to classical sculpture and just kind of hitting a balance of what felt right for Ridley. And if you look at the engineers just in the raw, not in their um, specialty costume, but just as a male physique, for the most part, the design is pretty simple. So when you were working, uh, and obviously you've done several films with J.J. Abrams, one of the films, I know he quoted you uh, saying that, that you really uh, nailed it, I think he was referring to uh, Cloverfield, but he was saying that you really nailed it, but obviously there was a huge amount of iterations to get to the point. You provided a lot to him as a director. And so I was just wondering if we could switch now to your process, because like uh, over time that must have changed. Presumably you've moved from working in traditional media to computer. When did that kind of happen? What is that process that allows you to do high iterations? Well, each director requires, I think, a, a specific process to help them see. Uh, JJ, for example, he, the reason he asked me to be involved with Cloverfield was namely because of the DVDs that I had done for the Noman School. He had those DVDs, JJ did, because he's a fan of art and education. And I got an email from him saying that I have your DVDs and I really love how you work. I would love to have you involved with my project. And I just thought, that's the strangest thing because I was off the radar. I was working on Avatar, but clearly the work wasn't public. And the stuff that I had done on, say, Garfield, um, it was also not on anyone's radar, quite frankly. Um, so I, I was pretty much an unknown. So to have JJ l find me via educational DVDs was really serendipitous, you know, crazy and all those things. But what he liked was the approach. Um, my use of silhouettes, which is not something I invented, it's just something that I've used and adapted over time, but using silhouettes to, to quickly convey broad stroke ideas and my use of, say, Photoshop and delineating form. He loved kind of the, uh, the appearance of the magic of being able to, in front of someone live, in this case on the DVD, start with a piece of white paper and then have it manifest into something that you can tell exactly what it is. And I even asked him, you know, thank you very much for involving me with Cloverfield, but <laughs> what, what do you expect me to, to give you? I've done a furry cat and uh, some visual effects. And he said, now just do your thing. And I kind of wonder what my thing was at that point, because I had a process, but I didn't really have a, a developed style. And Avatar was happening, it was kind of on the tail end of Avatar, so I was a little bit more comfortable in my creature skin. Um, but JJ's approach is much more about, okay, artist, I like your work, do what you do. Whereas, say, James Cameron is, I like your work, but this is what I need you to do to help you realize my vision. And as I say, it's just each director has a different approach to developing. But over the course of Avatar, we started with pencil only because that's what Jim wanted. He didn't want digital because at the time, digital kind of did mean still model building. And, and constructing things based on art, not really designing in a computer, other than Photoshop. And I had, fo uh, excuse me, I had ZBrush, but it was something I had on my computer for quite some time, so I wasn't really good at it, efficient at it. But I always knew that it was the most appropriate tool for Jim, and we just introduced it towards the tail end of the production, and it snowballed in a good way. And that became the way we worked. And that experience did influence other productions. And the one that kind of sort of sealed the deal was Green Lantern with regards to sketching in digital form, in the round in particular. The time frame did not allow for pencil sketches. Because as you know, you do a pencil sketch, it's a view. May have taken you an hour or so, depending on how you're sketching. You show it, they like it, sort of show me the other views, you have to interpret and figure out the other views, and you might prove that it doesn't work in other views. And you've spent a lot of time, whereas digitally, you can sketch it in the round, show it very quickly, and if 
they like it sort of, but things need to change, it happens in the same space and construct and object. So it's much more interactive, collaborative, and, and linear in terms of the, the asset that you're developing. So it is sadly, I say, undeniable that that is the process that works the most efficiently. But ZBrush got me to a point where it was good enough, I mean, it was great, it, it's obvious, with its resolve of object, but in terms of like, now we have to communicate proper lighting, proper materials, proper um, integration into a shot. I needed something that was significantly better than ZBrush for that. I definitely consider myself as, as an artist, but as a designer, the poster child of somebody who doesn't have the patience and doesn't have the time or even the interest in a way to, to learn software. I just want to get to that beautiful end result. And having explored all these other pieces of software, Modo really was the best answer for me. And consequently, it's the one that I do suggest um, to students and to colleagues. I've, I've sculpted things in clay and done molds and made them in silicone and punched hair and made it look real, which is fun. It takes days and you have to have a client that can envision what clay would look like in silicone, which is sometimes an unfair request. But today, I can do that same thing in a fraction of the time and show the client exactly what it would look like in lighting that they are planning on using in the shot with a background plate that they've already established. And in that moment, they can change their mind about everything and you can respond with them by your side because they know that they can now. So the, the upside of that is you can be really working with them and they can be collaborative and they can be getting more out of you. And the downside is if you're used to handing the design off and moving on, it can feel a little frustrating when it can be many more iterations than you've ever anticipated. But working with that efficiency, and with that realism, I prefer because you're allowed to really let the client drive you to assist them in realizing their vision, which that ultimately is our job. I wouldn't be uh, doing justice if I didn't mention the fact that when you continued to work with JJ Abrams, you ended up appearing on screen as a Romulan. I just have to ask you about that story because it's just a cracker. <laughs> it, it was fun, that's for sure. Um, well, the, the reason that happened was simply because of Eric Bana, who was going to be playing Nero, he and I are about the same general proportion. And we were doing makeup tests. I was designing it clearly with um, the makeup team. Joel Harlow was heading that up. And Joel and I knew that we wanted to show JJ some makeup tests, but there wasn't really in the budget a person that we could have a model come in, be that one that would sit in a chair, et cetera, et cetera. And secondly, when I met with Eric Bana to kind of explain the concept to him, um, which meant and he has a great head of hair. Shaving his head and putting in full scleral contacts that cover the whites of your eye, which is not a, not a comfortable thing. And then wearing rubber on your face and all those things, teeth inserts we're considering at one point. So Eric said, well, you know, the image that you're showing me looks cool, but why don't you try it first? And he was jesting, and it, but it planted the idea that I really should try it. I should know what this is about. I should know what I'm asking him to do because I'm asking it without any sense of uh, knowledge about what a scleral contact lens is. I hate wearing contacts. You say you were apprehensive yourself, weren't you, about Extremely those apprehensive. I wasn't apprehensive about any of the rest of it, but the scleral contact freaked me out. And I thought that's a little unfair if Eric is also freaked out and I might think, just, just do it. So I thought, well, I'll do it. And so we save money on having to have somebody come in and I was learning in the process, which was great, and I could direct and work with Joe Harlow the, the makeup as we're moving along, as opposed to just standing there waiting while it's happening on somebody else and checking in. So it was a really great experience, not knowing what the end result was going to be. We went down to set to show JJ, 
and we had a couple really, really good ideas that we were experimenting with, with piercings and tattoos, which ironically we used in the Klingons. But the, the funny thing was, I went down to set and JJ's checking it out and he's walking around and he's kind of being apprehensive about saying anything, looking around, wondering where Neville is. Because <laughs> he didn't know that it was me under the road, because I had to stay in character, because you have to sell it. And uh, so <laughs> JJ's like, is Neville going to show up? I said, oh, JJ, I'm here. And I ruined the character. And he's like, what? No way. So it was an amusing moment. JJ evaluated the, the design at this point, and he said, you know, it's a little much for Nero, because it had some cliche moments, the big scar across the face and so on. He said, but it's a cool Romulan character. The general morphology is neat, let's use all that, but let's get rid of the, the contact lens and the scar, et cetera. But Neville, you, would you want to be a Romulan? I was like, oh my God, that sounds great. Pop in for a day, a little bit of footage on me. And then it was like, I think I was on set for two weeks in total, a week and a half. When we advanced to the second Trek film and you were doing the Klingons, I know you did digital designs for them and that was a very interesting design problem, but it, what, what tools were you now using at that stage? At that stage with the Klingons, I felt like I had my pipeline down much better. You're never done with your pipeline in your process, but I really am in a very comfortable place where I feel like for the client, I can give them a, an idea, a range of ideas, and show it to them very early on in a way that represents the final product. But it's still very much for me in sketch form. It's, it's not beautifully textured, it's not beautifully modeled textures, there's nothing that, that's refined to the point that a visual effects house would really take your designs. But to most people, because the rendering that Moto can yield if you know how to handle it, it's not just going to do it on its own, but it, it gives you the world space and the equipment as a virtual photographer to be able to take your designs, put them in it, and have it look photographic. You know, every time you look back, and the Klingons are one of those things I look back on, and I'm, I'm pleased with the design and I'm pleased with the, the renders, but pleased is my concern because I'm not elated. Uh, I look at other artists' work who are truly, truly good at this stuff, and you know, I want to be that good, but I'm not that guy. I don't have that skill set, so I reach out to people to uh, help me hold my hand. Yazan being one of those people, quite honestly, who has been extraordinarily helpful with um, trying to answer the questions that I have about making certain materials look more organic. So f right now, I'm working really specifically on getting my materials and my texturing to feel much more realistic. So in terms of uh, your process today, um, when you are working uh, with a director, am I to understand that you're still prone to pick up a pencil and paper as your first thing, but that you, for speed reasons, will turn to computers? And is that, is that the, like moving forward if you were to be starting on a new project tomorrow? Yes, it is. But it's contingent on the subject matter. So for example, if we were doing a design, asked to do a design of a ape-like human character, yes, I can draw it, yes, I can illustrate it, et cetera, et cetera, but I find that the value in giving the client more options, um, I'm not giving them art, I'm giving them design and options. My pencil is a little bit more art, and a, a painting done with a brush is more art, but again, don't consider myself an artist, I consider myself a designer. So to be more efficient and, and mindful of the budget, I will, on something like an ape human character, it makes no sense for me. And quite frankly, if I'm directing a department of people and they picked up their pencils to start drawing ape creatures, I would actually tell them to not. I would, I would rather have people more capable in the digital world to start with a base head and give me options that way. But if the brief was, I want some kind of alien head that I have no idea what I'm asking you for, Neville, it's just different and crazy, it might make more sense to use pencil because you can quickly scribble out 
ideas much faster than you can digitally. Well, um, I guess in finishing, advice for, you, you have such a long history in education, um, and you must get asked this a lot, but advice for young uh, designers wanting to follow into character design and... Uh... I do have advice, and it, it, it comes pretty quickly because I've been asked the question from having been a teacher for a while. The, the first most obvious advice that I tend to give, particularly if you're going to work for people, um, as a designer in entertainment, whether that means games, but particularly with film, is to remember one thing in particular, and that is that you've been hired, n not just because you're talented, but you've been hired to help somebody realize their vision. You've been hired to help somebody realize what has maybe been their dream for many years. So knowing that, and knowing that it's not about you per se and your um, artistic prowess. It's really about you helping them. It makes the job um, really enjoyable. But if you think that when you've spent all this time on a character, on a costume, whatever it is, and it gets rejected, if you think that you know, it's a personal offense or that your design is not good, et cetera, et cetera, it's like, no, it's just not working for that particular client to satisfy their dreams. We're, we are tools to, and this is not a negative thing that I'm saying at all, we are tools to them. We're a hammer, we're a screwdriver, we're a nail, whatever it is that they're pulling out of the available toolbox of designers and illustrator to help them build some complete structure. So when you have that mindset going in, it's a privilege and a delight to be doing it. But if you think it's about you, it's going to be a miserable experience, I can guarantee you. It's also a very mature way to approach design. And if you don't like it and can't handle that, which might be a realistic um, condition, then be the person who's making all the decisions, which is delusional in itself, because there's always someone holding the purse strings. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Been a pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Well, it is that time again. The new October term at FXPHD has just started with a great range of 3D compositing and production courses, including some great responses to last term's course, as we'll hear from the guys. Thanks, Ange, and thanks to you, because this is our 30th term here at FXPHD, and we're particularly proud of not only the tremendous amount of work we've been able to publish and the great courses we've had on offer, but of the work of the graduates who have come through FXPHD over the years and gone on to work at some of the best facilities all over the world, set up their own teams, build their own pipelines, and literally work all over the world. So to them, congratulations. Well, what to do for our 30th term, we decided we'd come at you with some really great courses, just back to basics. And to that extent, we've been listening to what you've been saying, and one of the things you wanted was more 300 level courses. So for those of you that haven't been with us for 30 terms, let me explain how it works. We have 100, 200 and 300 level courses. So for example, in this term, in a second, we'll hear about our 300 level new course. That's our top of the line new course for people that are new professionals. But also we have 100 level courses, which are much more something you might do if you're trying to move over to Nuke from, say, After Effects. So we have these three different levels. In this term, we have four new courses, all at the 300 level, covering things from compositing to tracking to visual effects and more. Well, thanks for that, Mike. And yes, we have well over 110 courses on offer this term, including 11 new ones, which is what we focus on in this Orientation Week video. I'm gonna start out with our advanced level 300 base courses, beginning with our Premier Pro Advanced Workflow course. Now, Adobe has made some tremendous changes to the suite of applications the last couple of years that specifically target advanced users in the professional realm. And what this course is gonna help you do is kind of separate the marketing materials from the reality of working in those new features with things like the new incredible Premiere Pro to speed grade Interop, which is really gonna make things a lot easier. But before we hear from Bart about that course, I'm really excited to introduce our new 300 level advanced matte painting course. This is a course we've been working on for several terms at FXPHD, and now the timing is right with the right project and the right profs. We've got Nick and Ludo tag teaming for the course, and they're really talented map painters from Double Negative in London where they work on feature film work. And the idea is they're gonna tackle one shot over the duration of the term and tackle it 
really well. Hi guys, my name's Nick Marshall, and myself, along with fellow Professor Ludovic Iersham, will be teaching the Nuke 307 Advanced Map Painting course. This is going to be an advanced level course where we focus on just one shot that we take from concept, based on a brief handed to us by the director, and we're going to follow that through right to a, a final map painting and all the elements that we would normally deliver to comp if this were a feature film environment. Along the way we're going to cover blocking out a concept in shot using photo reference and the provided plates so that we know that we're getting everything right based on the, the elements that are given to us. Uh, from there we'll be taking the concept and producing a production ready matte painting um, and then jumping straight into Nuke to get our hands dirty on some of the uh, more, more advanced projection setups and set extension techniques uh, looking at proper 2.5D and 3D solutions within Nuke and how we can use those to provide all the elements that are required to complete the shot. Uh, there's going to be a particular emphasis on the power and limitations of, of map painting and how best to use it to your advantage in production. Um, the aim at the end of the course will be to have one fully photoreal map painting shot, a nice establishing shot, ready to deliver to the comp. So because we've tried to keep this um, as close to a real production scenario as possible, we'll be receiving um, a plate shot on location by the FX PhD team. Uh, and along with that we'll be receiving match move and roto elements so that we can just focus on producing the matte painting elements and getting all those um, worked up to a real photo real standard that we can deliver to the comp at the end of the process. Hello everyone, my name is Bart Valchak and I'm happy to bring you the Premiere 301 course this term. We'll explore the capabilities of Premiere Pro and the whole Creative Cloud suite as a finishing tool, especially looking at how it works in shared environment. We'll cover in depth such important issues like backup and archival of all your project files and metadata. We'll leverage the whole suite as a single tool and see how it integrates. We'll be having a few trips uh, to Prelude, After Effects, Audition, Adobe Media Encoder and especially with the advent of Direct Link to Speedcrate. We will also look at the interchange with other applications like Resolve or Smoke and evaluate the cost-benefit of such interchange and see what you can accomplish within the tool itself. Also, we shed some light upon performance issues, especially the ones connected to dynamic link, and we'll tackle the subject of color management throughout the suite. You can also expect a number of tricks and best practices to streamline your editing process, but most importantly, we'll be pushing the limits of the software to see when it breaks and what you really cannot do with it. After watching this course, you will be well prepared to avoid all pitfalls and to effectively use Premiere in your productions. This is an advanced level course, but you can always get to 100 level course from the vault and jump right in. All right, well, let's have a look at the other two 300 level courses we have on offer. In a second, we'll look at our new Flame course, 303, which is looking at the new version of Flame. This is the high level 300 Flame course looking at Flame 2014. But before that, we're going to look at our new Synthize 301 course. This is Advanced Survey Techniques with Victor. This is a top of the line tracking course using Synthize. Hello. I just uh, want to show you a few of the shots that we are going to be using in this uh, term. This is a shot that uh, all these blue points that you see here on the side are points that were actually surveyed with a survey station, so they're highly accurate, okay, because uh, things need to uh, match perfectly. Something else similar, but in this case, it's actually going to be uh, four cameras. Pretty much all the points that we have in here, all the trackers are survey trackers too. Whatever model you make for the first camera, it's going to perfectly match this second camera. It has its own survey points too, but also it's using a lot of uh, points that are actually cross-linked between the camera one and camera two. Then we have uh, a third camera that is actually a panoramic made out of uh, four photos and then we have a fourth camera that it's also matching uh, via cross links um, to the first second and third camera okay something else that we are also going to see is um, how to use um, geometries to perfectly match a complicated shot and get it to the point, you know, where you can load this into a 3D Studio or Maya or whatever. Anything that you're doing in here is matching reality, okay? And then we are also going to see uh, something based on a little scan with a few cameras too that we're going to uh, match to this model 
Uh, this is an extremely complicated shot, a lot of details. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of uh, things we haven't seen before, quite a few new features of the uh, software too. I hope it's going to get really interesting for you. So uh, see you soon. Hey guys, my name is John Gearing, and this is going to be my very first Flame class at FX PhD. Before learning Flame, I was introduced to After Effects, Maya, Mocha, and a bunch of other programs, so I'm always kind of looking to use the right tool for the job. In this class, we're going to cover a lot of ground, starting off in PF Match it, where we're going to get a 3D track. We're going to move on to Mocha and cover planar tracking. Then we're going to show some cool stuff in Nuke. Then in class number two, we're going to cover Maya and some of the basics there before finally getting into Flame, going over expressions, the distort node, and a bunch of other things new to the 2014 version of Flame. Then we're going to take a look at particles, both inside of Flame as well as inside of After Effects via Particular. Then we're going to take a look at a nested zoom that I built in Flame using expressions. We're also going to take a look at Atomize and a few other design techniques. After that, we're going to use PF Match It, Maya, After Effects, and Flame to put a camera move into a still. Then we're going to take another look at Maya going over how to get stuff from Maya into Flame. And the last two classes we're going to cover one of the hardest shots I've ever had to work on. It's a seamless transition that took me about four weeks to do. It's going to be a very cool class, and I hope you join me. Next up, let's talk about our 200-level intermediate base courses. They're obviously a bit less advanced than 300-level base courses, but they're still pretty hardcore and certainly push the limits of what you might call intermediate. We have a new Moto-based particle and dynamics course being taught by Pat Cranley that follows up on his introductory level course that he's done for us in the past. We also have a new 200 level motion graphics design based course in Cinema 4D and After Effects being taught by Ryan Summers, which is really going to be cool. But before we get to those, let's hunt it down to Sydney and hear what Max got up his sleeve with a new DOP course. One of the new courses I'm very proud to say we have is a new DOP course. And this actually builds on or kind of dovetails in with a lighting course we did a couple of terms ago. And returning is my good friend DOP Ben Allen. Ben, how are you? Good, thanks, Mike. Good to be back. So this term we're going to be looking at moving the camera, basically the grip department, how to move it, the tech behind it, because it's an incredibly important part of storytelling, isn't it, Ben? Absolutely. I mean, how you mount and move the camera is a huge part of cinematography and the cinematographer's craft. In fact, we're going to look at not only the tech and the cool gadgetry, but also framing in terms of, in terms of storytelling and the emotional content of a... Oh, Kelly, hi. I think uh, Ben needs you on set. Hi, Chris. And basically, um, gripping and grip gear is cool and lots of fun because, let's face it, grips have some of the best toys around. Absolutely, Ben. I have to say that these newer, smaller cameras are just incredibly powerful in what they can do and what we can put out of them. In terms of GoPros and mounting cameras, a whole new range of options are open to us. And that's going to include this, which is a Movi. In fact, well, it's not really a Movi. This is actually our own version of it. It's our own rig that we built obviously for a fraction of the price, but it's going to be one of the things we're looking at later in the term as we look, Ben, at our gadgetry in our DOP course. Yep, this one is going to be fun, Mike. And this is just an amazing rig, and it's one of just the really cool gadgets we're looking at this term in our DOP course. Hello everybody, my name is Pat Cranley and thanks for checking out MDO 201, an introduction to the particle and simulation systems inside of Modo. We're going to start this course by talking about replicators in Modo, as many of our simulated effects are going to include replicators in one capacity or another. From there, we'll advance on and start talking about the rigid body and dynamic simulations that we can create inside of Modo. And uh, after that, we're absolutely going to jump in and take a look at some of the different emitter types. From all of this foundation that we set in the earlier sections of the course, we'll be able to advance into some really neat things inside of Modo, like particle modifiers, flocking, and of course, maybe we'll even dabble in a little fluid simulation towards the end. Now we couldn't talk about particles without addressing how we're going to render them, so we'll take a look at rendering passes inside of Modo and specifically the FX items inside of the shader tree at the conclusion of this course. Thanks for checking out MDO201 and I look forward to seeing you in the forums. This semester I'm going to go over how I've learned to work quickly while staying flexible. And what better way to do that than to start off with an end tag. We'll break down how to use Trapco Particular to create a layered particle reveal. And then once we get the basics, I'll show how to pull 3D positional data from Zenim 4D to act as a source for fast rendering particles in After Effects. I'll also break down how I approach client reviews with particular, using off-the-shelf After Effects standards like Beam, CC Vector Blur, 
turbulent displays, and colorama to explore options quickly. There are a lot of tricks under the hood with particular to push into some unique looks that can be manipulated quickly when you have a client who isn't sure what they want. Halfway through the semester, we'll start to get into project breakdowns, the first being the Stage 5 ID project. We'll dive into Simna 4D as well as After Effects to figure out a couple of ways to use both programs to our advantage. We'll continue the project breakdowns by looking into how we use trap code form in the person of interest title sequence, as well as learn how to create quick UI elements that add visual interest without requiring too much heavy lifting. From there, we'll break down how a team of four was able to create the titles for Pacific Rim. We'll go over how the entire sequence was previsited in three days, as well as how the team was able to keep render times down to a minimum. All this, plus projects covering the Turbulence FD and X Particles plugins for Cinema 4D are planned. Which brings us to our 100 level courses. Now 100 level courses are not for complete novices, they're designed for people that are in the industry, but maybe want to learn an area that they're not familiar with, or move into an application or a craft they haven't done before. I'm going to introduce a couple and then John will round out the term. And the two I want to introduce start with our Games Engine course. It's the first course we've ever run. It's a 100 level course using the Unreal Game Engine. Now I'm really thrilled about this, not only because of the massive kind of box office numbers that we're seeing games do at the moment, but because understanding a games engine is kind of fundamental these days, given how much game engines are being used in previs, as well as just general visual effects. The second one will be our Animation 103 course. It's actually part two of what was started by Lucas last term when he did his Animation 100 level course. Now that Animation 100 level course got to a point where you guys were screaming out for us actually to finish this wonderful short film that he was doing. So this term, the 103 course will actually be on texturing, lighting, and finishing that same short film. But I'll let the guys explain. Hi, this is John Gress, and welcome to this Orientation Week video for the new Game Engine for Production course I'm really excited to be bringing you this term. A fast track to learning the epic Unreal Development Kit UDK3 Game Development Environment. This course will be a fast-paced introduction to the UDK3 Game Development Environment and Engine, covering the basics of pretty much the entire suite of UDK development tools and will take you from zero to building your own freestanding game in UDK in this one course. We'll start with an overview and of the tools that make up the UDK development environment and get familiarized with the interface and navigation of the UDK3 editor, the heart of the UDK development environment. We'll take a look at all the other components such as light mass, kismet, matinee, cascade, speed tree, and the sound cue editor. Then we'll take a look at level design flow theory and gameplay mindset. We'll look at the game design process, pre-production, the BSP and CSG geometry pipeline, the use of BSP and CSG brushes, static and skeletal meshes, texturing, and lighting. We'll create terrains, water planes, mountains, foliage and deco layers, skyboxes, volume effects, and physics. We'll then add interactive triggered animation, sound, particle systems, AI systems for bots, portals, and wrap up the last two classes by creating, packaging, and exporting your very own freestanding game. Of course, jumping in and test playing your level every now and then. And finally, we'll take a look at some cool new technologies enabling us to explore using a game engine as a real-time pre-visualization tool. I'm really excited to be bringing you this course and look forward to seeing you week one and in the forums. Hi there, I'm Lucas Martell. You might have seen a short film I did a while back called Pigeon Impossible. I also have a new one in the works called The Ocean Maker, which maybe you've seen some of the video that's starting to float around for that. Um, but anyways, this term at FX PhD, I actually have two courses going on. The first is Annie 102. What you're seeing here is everything that we did as part of that course. This is actually a rerun from last term, and you'll see why in just a second. Um, but in Annie 102, we basically start from nothing, just an idea for this short about a tree who gets a balloon stuck up in his branches and what happens when the kid comes to try to reclaim it. Um, so in that course, we came up with the idea. We did all of the, the writing and figuring out the... Uh, the storyboarding and the layout and everything. We also rigged all the characters, uh, did all the animation. Basically, everything that you're seeing here was uh, we started from scratch, and it's all part of Annie 102. Um, this term, we've actually decided that we want to extend that a little bit, and we want to flesh this out and turn it into a finished short film. 
So the new course for this term is Annie 103, um, which there we're going to be lighting all of the assets, basically taking everything that we did in the last course and expanding on it. We'll be texturing, adding materials, adding some of the cool effects like leaves, and basically fleshing out this entire frame and adding sound effects to turn this into a real finished 60-second short film. So. Um, both of these classes are going to be very, very heavily production focused. I'm actually doing everything in soft image, but it's not about software. It's very much about the techniques that you should be able to apply to virtually any package. So I try very hard to break things down in a way that this is something you can do in Maya, Max, Blender, pretty much anything that you are using. Um, so it's going to be a great term, and I hope to see you there. One of the great bonuses of an FXPHE membership is access to a wide variety of VPN software. What this means is you create a secure connection from your computer to our server. And when you launch an application, it pings our server, grabs a license, and you run the full version there right in your local computer. We have a wide variety of software available from things like Nuke to Hero, Mari, Houdini FX, Modo, Mudbox, Cinema 4D, RenderMan Pro Server, and more. It's really a great way to build shots for real and follow along with the course. And those of you who are interested in our next course, Nuke for After Effects Artists, I'm sure will find that VPN valuable. And the idea behind this course is to help you make the transition between the layer-based After Effects system to Nuke's node-based compositing environment. Let's hear from Josh what he's got planned for the term. Hey guys, my name is Josh Govincio. Welcome to the overview of Nuke 110 Nuke for After Effects users. Now we're working really hard to make this the definitive course of anyone coming from After Effects or layer-based workflows to learn Nuke and its nodal-based workflow. We're going to start the first few classes by directly comparing the two programs, the timeline, the keyframes, media management, color management, masks, channels, effects, and so much more. The rest of the course is going to be project-based classes. So not only will the project start to get more complex and harder, it'll force us to start thinking with nodes. I'm really excited for you guys to start learning Nuke, and I know you'll love it once you clearly see it for what it is. So I'm looking forward to diving right in with you guys, and I'll see you in the forums. Our next new course this term is our new introductory shotgun production pipeline course. And Don, we've been working on this for a while. I'm really excited to have you guys involved this term. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor. Now, we initially start out by telling you we normally have one person lead the entire course, but based upon the variety of installations and the variety of uses of software, you advise us probably not the best idea. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's going to be fun and more appropriate to have a variety of, of people teaching specific classes. Um, we're trying to cover a lot with the software. We're trying to build tools for everyone in the studio, from the, the production team to the artists, to the supervisors, to the pipeline engineers. Um, in this course, we're going to try and cover soup to nuts, how to get set up really fast, how to get going, uh, how to begin to move your dailies workflow into the system. And we're going to go pretty deep on the pipeline side and talk about how to get set up with all the pipeline tools and to really trick out the pipeline. And it just seemed like maybe we should bring on specialists uh, for each one of those classes and uh, do it as a group effort. But then at the end, you're going to actually bring that all together with uh, some of your clients who've actually put the pipeline in really uh, solid implementations at some high-end studios to, to share their tips and techniques. Yeah, some of our clients completely amaze us. We call them the, our pipeline heroes, and we're going to invite a bunch of them in to just show what all you can do um, with pipeline on top of our tools. It should be, should be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's going to be a great course, and actually these guys have set up a really special offer for those of you who are taking part in the course this term at FXPHD. Normally they have a 30-day trial, so you can check it out, but they've gotten a special version for those of you at FXPHD, and you've got full access to it through the end of January 2014. So it's going to be a great way to follow along with the course, and we'll see you in the forums. So as we highlighted at the beginning, a great run of new courses, as well as a stack of really good repeat courses and vault courses on offer here at FXPHD. There's one other course that you get kind of for free. It doesn't count in your sort of course listings. It's a weekly magazine show that we do called Background Fundamentals, which covers the business side of things, as well as just fundamental technology and new techniques that we think you want to keep up to speed with. Background Fundamentals free each week in addition to anything else you do here at FXPHD. That's it for us. Hope you'll join us, fxphd.com. I'm Mike Seymour. On behalf of John and the entire team here that have been here now, as I say, for 30 terms. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll see you in the forums.
Well, that's all we've got time for, so thanks for watching. Until next time, see ya. For more industry news, in-depth features, podcasts and forums, check out fxguide.com. And for visual effects training, check out fxphd.com.